Hello, my name is John Hearn, and I'll be giving the lectures this week on hydroelectric power. If you haven't already done so, um, please read the second chapter of the book. So you can pause the video uh, to read the chapter and then, and then come back to it. I'll be bringing in some additional information throughout the presentation, but a quick background uh, read would help. So let's get started. All right, so hydroelectric power is just a, a form of solar energy. So remember that there are only three primary sources of energy on Earth. Solar radiation, rotation of the Earth and Moon system, and heat from the Earth's core. So the water cycle is powered by the sun. And it's powered by the sun in the form that it uh, causes evaporation of the water, uh, primarily from the ocean, but it also evaporates water from uh, lakes and rivers. And uh, this uh, evaporated water rises in the sky to form clouds. And so this gives uh, water potential energy. Uh, which is just the mass of the water times the acceleration of gravity times the height of that water. Uh, now, when the rain falls back to the earth, most of the potential energy is lost as it moves from the clouds, which uh, may be at around 10,000 feet, to land, which may be at around 1,000 feet. Um, in addition, most of the rainfall, 78%, occurs over the ocean. So most of the precipitation, most of the water goes right back into uh, uh, at sea level, and so the potential energy um, is lost there. So I thought we would uh, start um, with just sort of a, a depressingly inefficient calculation of how hydroelectric power is not good solar power. Okay, so um, if you add up all the sunlight striking the Earth's surface during a year, uh, that comes out to be about 5.7 times 10 to the 24 joules. Now, most of this is uh, used for other things, but around 20 to 25 percent of it is used to drive the water cycle. So, of the sunlight striking the Earth, uh, only 1.25 times 10 to the 24 is used to drive the water cycle. So of that, only a small fraction of that is used for lifting water to give it potential energy. Most of it is used in evaporating the water. Now this is uh, also good for the planet because water is a greenhouse gas and so it uh, as it forms clouds it releases that energy back into the atmosphere and so this does help uh, keep the planet at a at a more comfortable and uh, life giving temperature but as far as our discussion today most of the potential energy um, is uh, is uh, the potential energy is only a small fraction of that um, sunlight that's used to drive the water cycle. Okay, so if we take that, since most of the rain falls over the ocean, we lose all of that potential energy. So now we're down to about 10 to the 22 joules per year available for uh, hydroelectric power. Now, if we keep going uh, and we take that 10 to the 22 joules, and we look at it, um, most of it uh, is lost when the rain falls from the cloud to the ground. And so if you just um, ballpark a 10,000 uh, foot cloud raining down to 1,000 foot elevation, then we're left with 1.1 uh, times 10 to the 21 joules of energy. Now, the actual power production in 2019 was almost 10 to the 20 joules. So we're only getting about 10% of that. Um, now, if you look at this, uh, just from solar radiation, we started off with 5.7 times 10 to the 24 joules of sunlight. Uh, and we're only harnessing around 10 to the 20 joules for hydroelectric power in 2019. So this is a 0.0016% solar efficiency. 
Um, but uh, fortunately, that's not really the metric that we use uh, because even if we didn't use it, uh, the water cycle is going to continue. So this hydroelectric power is, uh, you know, as far as the potential energy of the water goes, free. And if we don't use it, it'll just go back into the ocean. So, um, so we might as well uh, uh, take advantage of the potential energy that is, uh, is there. Okay, so water has two energetic terms. Um, there's uh, the kinetic energy of moving water and the potential energy of water at a higher elevation. So these are just your uh, standard physics definitions of kinetic energy, one-half mv squared, and potential energy, which we already mentioned, is the mass times uh, acceleration due to gravity times the height. Um, now, uh, to harness that, typically it's done uh, with a, a, a dam and a reservoir. Okay, And this is just a, a high-level overview of uh, what this looks like. So, um, uh, typically, uh, governments or uh, other uh, entities will um, uh, dam up a river to form a reservoir. And then uh, some of that water is directed to a turbine uh, through what's called the penstock. And the penstock is just a, uh, an appropriately sized tube that delivers water to the turbine. Um, and then the turbine is what takes uh, the water, the energy from the water, and turn it into um, uh, shaft work. And the shaft work is, is really what we're after when uh, we're talking about hydropower. Um, and then the water is then discarded downstream at a lower elevation. And so we're able to take advantage of uh, the potential energy and or kinetic energy uh, that's in the water. So um, most hydropower systems um, take advantage of potential energy of water that's stored behind dams. So this is a picture of Hoover Dam, and um, the amount of energy is based on the height difference between the reservoir water and the downstream water, and so that's illustrated here in the graphic, this height right here, um, and the potential energy is just MGH. Now, I just want to put a little asterisk here. If you want to know the total stored energy so how much stored energy do I have over here? Then we need to use the average height of the water, uh, of the stored water. And that's because um, as you use water, the height goes down. So we would want the average height. Okay, so I thought we'd work just a quick example um, looking at the power production. So here the example is Hoover Dam has an effective waterhead of 187 meters and allows up to... 1,250 cubic meters per second of water to pass through the turbines, which operate at 90% efficiency. What is its maximum power output? Now, we're looking for the maximum power output. So that means that we're interested in uh, not um, the average height. We want to know the maximum height. And so that's just based on the 187 um, meters. Okay, so um, first you'll notice that uh, the equation has a mass flow rate, so this is going to be in kilograms per second, and we're given volume flow rate. So we need to first turn that uh, volume flow rate into the mass flow rate, and that's just related by the density. So this term is going to go into this equation right here. Uh, the other thing is that we it's operating at a 90% efficiency, so we need to throw in an efficiency term on the front end of this equation that um, accounts for that. All right, and so this is what the uh, result looks like. We've got the power. This is the efficiency, eta, the density, rho, the volume flow rate, v dot, G, the acceleration due to gravity, and H. And so here are all the quantities that were either given to us in the problem statement or in the case of G and rho, we can simply look those up. So this computes to 2.1 gigawatts. And so this is the peak 
power production for um, uh, the uh, hydroelectric dams um, uh, for the Hoover Dam. Okay, so I thought we would walk through just a, a quick uh, history of hydroelectric power. Um, and hydropower, so if we take out the electric, um, hydropower dates back to antiquity. Um, and uh, it was uh, typically uh, harnessed using water wheels. And water wheels were used to drive uh, mills or textile, um, uh, in, in the more modern times, textile factories. And the essential idea here was that the water wheel took the energy from water and turned it into mechanical shaft power. Now, because this was mechanical shaft power and not electrical power, um, it was limited to local use. That is, it had to be used on site or very close to um, the uh, water wheel. All right, so... Um, the uh, hydropower really was revolutionized in the early 1800s um, by uh, Benoit Fourniron, who invented the first commercial water turbine. So um, this happened in 1827, um, and uh, he... Um, he revolutionized this, and we'll talk about why when we take a look at his turbine. Uh, but this is this is really where hydropower um, uh, changed. So then, in 1831, Michael Faraday discovered electromagnetic induction, and so this is a process by which a, a changing magnetic field induces a current in a coil of wire. Um, and this, you've probably seen some demonstrations uh, that sort of illustrate this, but I thought I would uh, show you a quick one. And uh, here it is right here. Let me see if I can play it. Okay, so here this is a DC motor demonstrator, and you'll see that uh, there are a couple of coils of wire and two magnets at either end. And so these coils of wire um, when this is um, spun experience a changing magnetic field okay so as the wire moves from one end to the next like that then the um, a current is induced in the coil of wire all right and so what I'm going to do here is take um, take a voltmeter and connect it up to uh, uh, to the demonstrator. All right. So and it's set to a millivolt reading, and uh, then I'm going to spin it. And if you notice, as I spin it, the millivolts go up. And this is how um, shaft power can be turned into electrical power simply by turning a device like this. Um, or, um, uh, of course, uh, modern generators um, are much more sophisticated than this. Let me. Okay, so um, uh, your your textbook actually offers a little bit of confusion for this. So let me let me read um, an excerpt from the textbook. So uh, in 1834, French engineer Benoit Fourniron patented the first water turbine characterized by the vertical axis, completely submerged blades, and over 80% efficiency. That's all true. Um, it, the 1834 piece, I think, is when he patented it. I have 1827 in my slide because that's when uh, he actually uh, developed his first water turbine. Okay, and then they say the first hydroelectric power station was opened in 1837. And so notice this early date for a hydroelectric power station. I couldn't find anything in the literature or just on the internet that supported such an early date for hydroelectric power. Um, this is, however, uh, the 1837, uh, is the date for an improved Forty Rond turbine capable of uh, a 2300 RPM uh, rotation and 
uh, 60 horsepower, which was immediately installed to power industry in Europe and the United States. So uh, these were definitely landmark um, years. However, uh, the earliest date that I can find for the first hydroelectric system was in 1878. So this is uh, 47 years after Faraday discovered electromagnetic induction. And this was a private hydroelectric system at Sir William Armstrong's estate. So here's a, a, a picture of his estate, which I'm, I'm pulling from this uh, article here. And um, uh, he uh, essentially, you know, if you, if you look at what he did at this estate, um, it was uh, fantastic. He, he essentially, it was his, uh, his playground for uh, uh, trying out new things. And so one of those was a hydroelectric system to power lights. And so he used uh, uh, the hydroelectric system, which was just, was really close by. I mean, I, th I think it was maybe a, a one or two kilometers away. And, uh, and then ran wires up to the house to, to power lights. But this was the first hydroelectric system. Um, after that, uh, the first public hydroelectric system um, was in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And so this uh, was the first one that was available to the public. After this, uh, there was really just sort of an explosion of hydroelectric systems in the 1880s and 1890s. Here's just a sampling of those. Um, these are DC transmission systems, direct current, and uh, you can see that they were installed all over the world, Switzerland, France, Italy, the United States, um, with varying voltages and kilowatts. Um, they had transmission distances up to 22 kilometers here in the United States in uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, and then there's a, a separate list for AC transmission systems. Of course, our uh, electrical system is now um, alternating current, um, and so you wouldn't find any really you know, DC um, generation uh, these days. Uh, but these also were all over the world. Italy in 1886, France, Switzerland, the United States had one installed in 1890, uh, which spanned 21 kilometers, again in Portland, Oregon, um, and then England. So um, there was a really rapid development during the 1880s and then into the 1890s of hydroelectric systems. Um, now, interestingly, Farney Run's turbine was not used to produce electrical power until 1895. So all of these early electro uh, hydroelectric systems were not based on Farney Run's turbine. Um, and his was uh, the first time his turbine was used was in 1895 on the um, at Niagara Falls um, to generate electric power there. Okay, so let's go back to antiquity and uh, take a little look at um, uh, water wheels. Now, water wheels, this is just sort of typically what you think of when you think of a water wheel, um, where you've got these wooden buckets or wooden uh, reservoirs that uh, water falls into and then drags the the wheel down because of gravity and then dumps it out at the bottom and then rises up on the other side you have um, empty buckets and so there's a weight uh, the, the weight of the water uh, continuously drives this wheel. Um, now there's a lot of work done um, on this and uh, uh, in the you know early 19th century uh, late uh, 18th century and um, the optimum paddle speed was found to be two-fifths of the incoming water speed. And by the 19th century, these water wheels were made of iron and not wood. And so they were able to get to 80 to 90 percent efficiency in harnessing uh, the energy from the water, transferring the water's um, work potential into shaft work. Um, so this is this is actually really uh, impressive efficiency for such primitive technology. Um, so why change? Uh, there were really two reasons why uh, the water wheels were insufficient to drive 
um, the power and energy needs of the Industrial Revolution. And uh, that is, it had limited... Uh, it was limited to low head shoots. That is, um, uh, they were only good for a four meter um, uh, a potential or a four meter uh, water drop, and they were limited in the speed that they could um, spin at. And so these two limitations um, kind of uh, really hindered their application uh, to um, some industries, powering some industries. And so that's really where the Fourneuron turbine transformed hydropower. And so here's just a, a real quick schematic of his uh, turbine. And uh, it was uh, composed of a few pieces. There, first, the, the water actually flew into the center of the turbine. Okay, so it, flew, it flowed down through this into uh, this distributor, which is uh, labeled B here in this figure. The distributor um, was fixed. It did not move. And it directed the water out radially to a, a spinning um, outer uh, part of the turbine. And this is, this is what actually spun. Um, and so then uh, the, it was an inflow to outflow um, uh, water uh, turbine. And I've got a, a quick um, simulation here or an animation that I found online that I thought I would uh, show you real quick. So this is uh, the uh, Farnieron's uh, turbine, which again was used for shaft work. This wasn't used until 1895 for hydroelectric power, but um, so this is what the distributor did. So notice that the distributor doesn't move. Um, it just directs the water outward. Um, and so it gives the water a, um, uh, a an outward velocity, which then the blades, the moving blades, capture. And that's what drives those blades. And so here you can see just one of these um, as it goes into the blade. Uh, the water is ejected in one direction, which, according to Newton's laws of motion, for every reaction, there, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, and so this causes those blades to spin. Now, his um, his turbine was even uh, uh, better than than that. Notice, so here they're gonna they're gonna stack up and build uh, this next section here. Notice that. Um, there's the shaft, so it was a vertical shaft work, and then there was sort of this collar that uh, went down into the um, uh, down into the distributor, okay, like this, and then they could adjust the speed of it by raising and lowering this so that more water flowed through the veins and less water flowed through the veins and so you can see that here in this uh, part of the animation um, and then if they wanted um, a faster uh, speed they would then lift it up so they could throttle the turbine to uh, match whatever the power needs were um, at the time okay and so uh, this uh, sort of what it looked like. All right, let me go ahead and and move. Well, you can see here at the top, you would have the shaft work um, would be um, sent to whatever the devices were uh, that they were interested in. All right, let's see. Go next slide. Okay, so, but interestingly, the Fourneuron turbine is not on this list. So this is a figure that's straight out of your um, textbook. And uh, you'll see that there's um, four turbines listed, the Pelton, the Turgo, the Francis, and the Kaplan turbines. And uh, it's just kind of interesting that the Freeron turbine doesn't even make the list. Apparently, um, it revolutionized uh, hydropower, but these other turbines are better suited and, uh, I guess, more efficient uh, than... Uh, 
and maybe more scalable um, than the Forniron turbine. So we're going to take a look at each one of these turbines to see how it captures energy from water. Uh, and you'll notice here on the slide, there's two types of turbines, impulse turbines and reaction turbines. So we'll take a look at the difference between those two. What, what is an impulse turbine and then what is a reaction turbine? Okay, so first, the Pelton turbine, this is an impact, uh, oh, sorry, an impulse um, turbine, and um, uh, it, it requires high head pressure and high water velocity. So the way that it gets high head pressure is uh, the difference in height from your reservoir to the bottom of the penstock where your nozzle is has to be very great. And... Uh, Looks like I went ahead and clicked on the next slide. So here, <clears throat> this is a, an animation of the Pelton turbine. Okay, Now, I put an added bullet here. These are costly buckets. So you see these little buckets here? Those buckets are very expensive to manufacture because they're, uh, they're not a nice, you know, sort of... Um, uh, th there's a, a ridge in the middle, so it's essentially like sort of two spoons that are welded together. Here, let's take a look at the animation. So you'll see here, the water jet comes in and collides with this, and you'll see over here, um, it throws the water out the other way. So again, this is just Newton's uh, law of motion. Every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And so it's capturing, it's taking all of the kinetic energy from the water, and it's turning it into... Um, shaft energy. All right. Now the the bucket was essential to the um, um, the bucket was essential to the Pelton turbine. If you didn't have that ridge in the middle where it split the water flow into two, um, it essentially just splatters water everywhere and um, and doesn't. Is, is very inefficient and so um, so you can't just use like big spoons you have to have that ridge that splits the water jet into two pieces one that is ejected out one side and the other that's ejected out the other side so because of that these uh, buckets are costly to um, both manufacture and uh, they tend to wear out pretty quickly I mean, you can imagine you're hitting it with uh, a very high velocity of water and so they, uh, they they can wear out. All right, so um, oop, let's keep going. All right, so the turbo turbine, um, I think the, the best way to sort of understand these is they are half of a Pelton turbine. Okay, so the Pelton turbine had this ridge in the middle. Um, the turbo, the turbo turbine, um, notice that your water jet comes in at an angle and it hits and then it goes out. So this is essentially half of the Pelton turbine. Um, now, because the water jet comes in at an angle and then the water leaves at an angle, um, it uh, the exit flow doesn't interfere as uh, as much um, as it does with the Pelton turbine, where the water flow uh, may hit uh, the next um, uh, bucket. Okay, so um, it's also cheaper to manufacture. These are cheaper runners because uh, you could, I saw one guy online who was building one of these turbo turbines just out of spoons because they're curved and he could get it to work. And I'm sure it wasn't, uh, you know, real efficient, but um, he, could, he could build a turbo turbine out of spoons, but you can't build a Pelton turbine out of spoons. So it's a little bit simpler to manufacture, uh, which makes it a little bit cheaper. Okay, so um, so those are both um, the impulse turbines. So here, this this is the Francis turbine, um, which operates on sort of a different uh, kind of principle. Um, the water is uh, sent around the turbine in this uh, big sort of tube. As it goes around the the turbine, the tube diameter gets smaller. And the reason for this is uh, the idea is to try to have a uniform influx of water from the outside of uh, the turbine. Now notice this is sort of um, the opposite of 
uh, Furnirons turbine. So Furnirons turbine had water coming in the middle and then out the edges. Here we're coming in the edges and then out the middle. And so this turbine um, operates uh, by that principle. We'll take a look at a couple of the, the blades here. So the Francis turbine combines both impulse and what's called reaction. Okay. Now reaction turbines um, work based on the lift principle, which um, you know in airplanes it's the Bernoulli principle that that uh, gives you uh, gives you some lift and. Um, and, and that is uh, the reaction part of the turbine. The impulse part is where the water strikes and you're grabbing the kinetic energy of the water by essentially stopping the water. Okay, So the lift, the reaction turbine, you're using the flow of water going past a blade. Think your typical um, overhead uh, fan in, you know, uh, in your room. Um, that is the, um, the reaction turbine. Um, and the Francis turbine combines both of those. It uses some of the reaction and some of the impulse as the water drives the turbine. Okay, lastly there's the Kaplan turbine. And so this turbine relies on the lift effect of flow. Um, so this is, this is just the lift effect. Um, they, uh, this sort of looks like a, just a big propeller that you might find on a boat. And um, they, have, they typically have adjustable blades so that they can optimize efficiency. Um, and so that's just dependent on uh, how fast the water flow is. And um, they, can, they can adjust that on the fly to get um, the best, the most efficient um, uh, shaft workout. All right, so there are two types of turbines for hydropower. There's impulse and reaction. So impulse captures the kinetic energy of water and converts it into shaft work. Reaction captures energy through pressure differentials. I mean, think something similar to the Bernoulli effect, right? And um, these differ from traditional water wheels um, that either, so the water wheels, you can have these overshot water wheels that turn potential energy into shaft work. So you've got water that's at a higher uh, elevation. It goes down to a lower elevation. Or these uh, stream wheels that just capture the energy of moving water, right? And so, so the turbines um, sort of work on some different principles than the uh, water wheels. All right, so I want to end this lecture uh, with what I think are the real advantages of hydropower. Okay, um, and uh, I can sort of we got three bullet points here. One, reservoirs allow hydropower to be stored until needed. So essentially, think about reservoirs as these big batteries, right? We can store the water and then use it when needed, which means it can be turned on and off to meet demand. So this is uh, really um, a nice. Uh, especially renewable energy. So if you think about wind and solar, well, what if I need power when wind isn't blowing or when the sun isn't shining? So wind and solar have to rely on other technologies in order to uh, help production match demand, right? So we have to produce electricity when we use it. So wind and solar would need um, either some pump pumped hydro power system to store um, energy or batteries or you know something like there's different technologies that are being developed for that but uh, but this is not needed for hydropower um, and, and I think amongst renewable energies this is the real advantage of hydropower so in the next lecture what we'll take a look at are some of the um, uh, disadvantages of hydropower so we're gonna actually take a look at what are what are the environmental footprints of hydropower what are the costs associated with it because there's no free lunch we don't there there is a cost to generating electricity um, from hydropower and so we'll take a look at at what those are um, in the next uh, lecture thank you